Hello, friends. I'm glad you're able to join me this week. Um, I've got a few things to cover before we get into our topic for the week, which is exegesis, subtitled The Beginning of the Reflection Process. Uh, first of all, I continue to receive your reflections. Very nicely done. I appreciate getting them. A couple of things. Uh, I need to receive these, uh, these pieces as documents. Uh, some have sent them in other formats. Uh, I, I would have to reformat them, and I'm afraid I'm, I'm just not able to track that well this week um, and, and get that done. Besides which, you should be submitting in the format in which it's taking place. It's an assignment, and so I expect to receive it as a document. If you have not, if you've got a note from me to reformat it and send it back to me as a document, please do that as soon as possible. If you haven't submitted something to me yet, uh, please do so as soon as possible. Uh, second item, your term project, which is due at the beginning of December. This is also a document, and it is a, um, a term paper, uh, which uh, should have the appropriate identifiers. You know, what is this? Uh, by whom? For whom is it being written? And satisfying the requirements for what course? Um, and all those things, dates, make sure that your name's on everything, that kind of thing. Uh, it's not quite the issue it was when we got a pound of paper in our boxes and we throw them down the, the uh, basement stairs to see which ones went first and got the highest marks, but um, it's still important that you do that. Submit it as a document for, for my uh, review. Um, I've said in the past that these term projects don't have to be posted. I see in the syllabus, however, uh, that they are supposed to be posted. So I ask that you uh, do that, uh, but post it as a document, as a link, so it's not taking up a ton of, of space on Brightspace, and uh, people may have a look at them there. Uh, if I post a written uh, item, it will come through as a link. Uh, however, I, I consider that pretty much an option rather than a requirement. Um, another point, please remember that your comments and questions on Brightspace not only benefit one another, but also lets me know that you're engaged. It's a sign of life for me. So classroom participation uh, comes through in that activity. Um, sometime when I feel I have more time, I'll tell you a somewhat harrowing story of the professor that Professor Fennell and I shared, uh, and who was a scary professor, uh, and, and uh, and how that turned out in terms of my participation in his class. So our topic of the day is exegesis, the beginning of the reflection process. Now for our purposes here today, the term exegesis means basically deep reading. We are reading out of the text. We're letting the text speak to us. And that takes a lot of, of foreknowledge, not necessarily of the text, but of things like language, uh, grammar, punctuation, uh, context, all those kinds of things that you explore in allowing the text to speak to us. That's exegesis. It has a corollary called eisegesis in which we impose our agenda, our meaning onto the text. And I'm going to get to that a little bit further in just a moment. Now, so... If this is the beginning of the theological process, why on earth are we waiting until we're almost halfway through the program before introducing exegesis as a topic of integrated theological reflection? Well, uh, the reasons have to do with our hermeneutical methods. Um, now, hermeneutics refers to how we read. It, it's related to the story of Hermes, who saw himself in a mirror, in a, in a, in a sorry, in a stream, as, uh, and had never realized how beautiful he was, and subsequently died from looking at himself. Um, <laughs> oh, I'm so beautiful! And um, so the uh, the whole topic of hermeneutics comes into play here, and we have so much overlay on the way that we read that it was decided that we would wait until the middle of the course and introduce this separately uh, uh, in order to go back to the beginning. Now, how we read 
the subject of hermeneutics is an issue that has been pretty much beaten to death throughout the late 19th century and all through the 20th century, probably culminating in the 1960s with the, uh, uh, with the work of Hans Georg Gadamer responding to a number of other philosophers uh, throughout the 20th century. And um, certainly this was all uh, very important at one time. It all sort of fizzled out eventually because it pretty much became agreed upon that there is no such thing as a pure reading of a text. First of all, the meaning of any given text is not limited to the meaning which the author intends. Uh, speaking as a, an author myself, I can tell you that I've literally read stuff that I've written 30 years ago and went, why oh, that's good, I wonder who wrote that. <laughs> and learned from my own writing years later, especially when I come across uh, poetry. I didn't publish a lot of poetry, but I did publish some. I'm sorry I'm moving around so much, you understand. I, I have had this uh, knee replacement and it makes me makes it almost impossible for me to find a comfortable spot to sit. Um, so there's hardly anything such as a p pure reading. We, we bring ourselves, we bring our experiences, we bring our presumptions, our prejudgments, that is our prejudices, to the reading. We bring our burden of eisegesis to the reading. Uh, we make all kinds of hermeneutical presumptions uh, with which we have to cope constantly when we're reading. Now, the previous two months have been spent trying to open up an awareness of these presum presumptions to you, among other things. And I'm wondering if any of that has, um, has been fruitful for you. Have you found that, that you started to think, wow, you know, I don't know the text so well, so I'm giving it meaning rather than waiting for it to come back to me. One of the failures of semiotics, that is symbology, that's the common word used now, one of the failures of semiotics in the late 20th century, early 21st century, that I find is that we no longer sit and wait for a symbol to offer up its meaning for us, but we rather instead crack it open and pour our preferred meaning into it. Um, so adding to and that this, is at that, best uh, very poor. You know, we have these presumptions, these, of, these of prejudgments, symbols. prejudices, if you will, I'm going to be turning this off that we time. bring to the game when we're reading a text. There's also the fact that our relationship to Scripture is rarely, if ever, a necessary relationship. I would say it is to the preacher. Uh, I wouldn't bet on it. Um, I read a paper once on how Luther's uh, uh, relationship to Scripture was more utilitarian than it was uh, necessary or material. Um, I would quibble with that, but it's worth listening to. In fact, our relationship to Scripture is most often possible rather than necessary. It's like friendship. Friendships have a various, uh, a, a high degree of variety and uh, they have their own fragility. Our relationships and friendship, though, uh, cannot, by definition, be material. They cannot be necessary. Uh, if you need someone that much, you probably should be reevaluating the relationship. Nor should it be utilitarian. Fact is, is that if your friendship is a utilitarian one, as in which one person uses the other, or there's even a symbiosis. Uh, in which they use each other to mutual advantage, I would doubt that that is uh, legitimately a friendship. Although the Greeks did have a category for that kind of friendship, in which they called it phileia. Um, and uh, certainly it's, it's uh, got a place within scripture as well. So a small question to open up at this point in considering your relationship to scripture and how you're going to sit down and how you're going to start to... Um, to have a conversation with this potential friend uh, is this. What is an example of your own prejudgment? That is to say, how are you about to impose your own interpretation upon the text that you haven't even really met yet? It's difficult to come to grasp with this. We're all nice people. You know, we like to think that we don't have prejudices. I did a, um, oh, it was only supposed to be two weeks. I ended up being a, an eight-week 
uh, two discussion groups over an eight to nine week period in which we talked about um, King's book, The uh, Inconvenient Indian. And somebody said to me at some point later on when I kept saying we have to keep our prejudices out in front of us, and of course the worst ones are people who are liberal who think that they don't have any prejudices. And, and that's not me talking, that's gone way back to the 60s. Um, and um, somebody who had uh, hijacked Pete Seeger, the folks that singer actually nailed on that one. And um, some of those, somebody said, well, I suppose you think you're so perfect. And I said, oh, no, my goodness, no. So what would be an example of how you limit your relationship with First Nations people? And I said, well, I'm still surprised. And keep in mind, I'm from northern Ontario. I grew up literally a stone's throw from a residential school. Um, I couldn't quite have reached it, but if, you know, if I'd walked a mile, I could have, could have knocked a window out if I wanted to, and vice versa. Um, and I said, I'm still surprised when I meet First Nations people who are capable of happiness. Uh, I'm sorry. I, I, you know, when I say it out loud, it sounds terrible. Uh, but it, it is a way in which I limit my view of others. And, and you know, I've got to keep an eye on that all the time. What is an example of your own prejudgment when you're sitting down to the text? This can be true of any relationship, by the way. Your spouse, your child. What is an example of what you are imposing upon that relationship. When you sit down to your text, whether or not you've ever read it before, ask yourself the question in different ways. And one really good way of saying is, what do you want this text to say? What do I want this text to say? I had a, a, a there's a person of whom I'm extremely fond. He's a, among other things, he's a, a lay worship leader. And, um, been an extremely dedicated church man his entire life. And he, um, he I, I was at a sermon that he gave, and he obviously had put a great deal of time and thought into it and used some weird translations. I, I, I'd never even heard of some of these translations. And I asked him after what was going on. He was trying to reconcile the idea of the utility of creation in relationship to humanity with the necess necessity of, of a, an eco-friendly theology. Uh, and, and so he knocked himself out taking a text from Genesis and, and found an English translation which, which fed that, that need that he had. In fact, a terrible translation. The, the word that he was beggaring in uh, Hebrew is kabash, which means footstool, footstool in biblical Hebrew. And it's a... It's a um, it's a word that's used to describe um, a, a um, rape in warfare as well, to make them as footstools, um, or to make that nation as a footstool. So uh, he went over the top in seeking a, a uh, liberal, eco-friendly, uh, environmental uh, text that he could use for the purposes of his uh, agenda. Uh, I, I applaud him the sentiment, however, he's making that same uh, error of proof texting that we uh, certainly would not uh, agree to were it coming from a different direction in the Christian spectrum. So um, we have to watch out for those kinds of things. What do we want this text to say? What do we really want it to say? And we bring forward our, our desires there. One of the things I really love about Scripture is it almost tells me what I don't want to hear. Uh, and that's, that's the voice I'm always looking for, and I would encourage that in others. So, first of all, the role of exegesis. Uh, we, have to be, we have to be aware if we've explored this path before either intrinsically to the text in front of us or in generally in terms of the topic and, and its and, and context. Um, in a book called Personal Knowledge by a fellow named Palanye, I think it was published in the 60s, uh, he notes that rats having once learned a route to the reward cease to seek new uh, passages. Uh, he suggests that human beings are the same and that we have to be careful that we not forget to look for new surprises all the time, because there's new surprises there all the time. 
the first rule of exegesis, therefore, I would, I would ask you uh, to consider. The first rule of exegesis is to forget you're doing it for a reason. Just, it's just fun. At, at, at most, beyond fun, it's a deepening of a personal relationship. Um, I used to belong to a songwriting workshop, and uh, we were splitting up into, into pairs to do a songwriting, um, a songwriting exercise. And a fairly well-known uh, musician from Ontario uh, uh, said, I'll, I'll take Zub. Uh, I've known him for years, and I hardly know him at all. We're going to have a conversation. And he's going to get to know me, and I'm going to get to know him a little bit. And it never even occurred to me at that time that we never actually had a conversation. Uh, we're good friends, by the way. We have this in us to have this conversation, but we can't do it if we bring a whole bunch of stuff to the table. So let's just forget we're doing it for a reason. Forget that you need this for a sermon. Forget that you need to do exegesis to pass that course in, in, in baby Bible. You, know, you need nothing from this conversation other than the relationship. And I don't even think you need the relationship. It's just fun. So I'm not going to provide you with a particular methodology uh, here. I, I have some suggestions, for instance, of what you might want to look at. You, you've got this pericope, this section, this bit of Bible sitting in front of you. It occupies a space in a larger story, which is a, um, a pericope in its own right. Uh, what, what place does it hold in there? What is the story within the story? Uh, and what is the vanishing point of the story? What point does the story you're in disappear? What is the story before your story? What is the story that comes after your story? See, I'm talking stories again here. These are all really important parts of your exegesis. Words, words. What are repetitive words, terms, or concepts that keep coming up? What do those words, terms, and concepts mean in the original language, or at least in the, the original biblical language? And I have made reference to um, Bible Hub as a source for some of those things. You'd be surprised we can get from the names in a story. The Book of Ruth, the first two chapters is just a hoot when you learn the meanings of all those names uh, and, and apply them. Uh, you have uh, you, the gospel records, you have, there, there are name changes. Why, why do the names change? This came up on Bright Space a while ago. It, it, some, some good topics were touched upon but barely explored as to what comes up. What comes up when we look at the specific words uh, that uh, pop up? Uh, and you still get surprised. I mean, a couple of weeks back, as I mentioned, uh, when I was doing some exegesis in the book of Acts, not one of my favorite pieces of writing, and realized that Luke, who wrote Acts, of course, uh, was, uh, was using the term uh, therapeo for healing. And the the density of that word, which within both Hellenic and Koine Greek, not only as healing, but as a form of service, therapeo, therapy was the word we get from that, uh, and the implications of that throughout. So this is just touching upon the subject of exegesis. Uh, answer some of those questions for yourself. What are some of your, what are some of your guiding missteps when you sit down I mean, can you actually say at this point, every time I sit down the scripture, I make the same darn mistake. I start by doing da. Try to answer that question. Um, tell us a little bit about your method when you sit down to the scripture. Can you let go of the agenda of writing a sermon or making it fit into a particular uh, uh, context? Um, you know, and sometimes you can't. I, it, it was... It was uh, 19 years ago, I think it was, you know, and I was sitting down in my office and I was writing the funniest sermon I've ever written. I was giving my congregation a break. Funny, I tell you. And I got a call. It was my younger daughter. And she said, I don't know what's going on, but go home and turn on the TV. And I threw the sermon out. It was November 11th. Sept I'm sorry, September 11th, um, 2001. And uh, I mean, I had no choice but to speak to the context that day from the scripture that I'd already decided was the funniest thing that anybody ever wrote. 
Give an example of your surprising discovery when you let that go. When you realize that you are approaching Scripture for the sake of a richer and deeper relationship with Scripture and not for any kind of utility that follows. Give an example of a surprising discovery that comes when you're not looking for anything at all in Scripture. And you'll be well on your way to an exegetical method. If you want to go further than that, please go ahead. This will be posted on Brightspace. I've been sending it to you in your uh, the link to your emails, but I also send it to you uh, in Brightspace when it uh, when it's done, and uh, you can uh, make your comments on that um, on that thread. Thank you for bearing with me. I'm only allowed to take medication every six hours, and I'm just about due. And I realize I'm losing my sense of flow and coherence. Uh, you've been very patient. Uh, thank you, and we'll talk to you soon. Bye for now.